Good afternoon. Welcome to the Forest Practices Board webinar, Protection of Fish Habitat under the Forest and Range Practices Act. Thank you for your patience as we've gotten started this afternoon. We're having a little bit of technical difficulties that we're going to work through. Hopefully we get it right for you. My name is Sky. I'll be moderating today's event. I'm the Executive Operations Coordinator for the Forest Practices Board. I'm hosting this webinar on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking people of the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. As a guest, I recognize the importance of their historical relationship with the land that continues to this day. In a moment, I will introduce you to our panelists and the team that worked on this project. First, I would briefly like to run through the flow of today's webinar. The format for today's event will be a half hour presentation followed by a half hour question and answer opportunity. The questions for a question and answer portion will be gathered from you, our audience, using a thought exchange platform. I've just displayed a QR code and the web address to take you to the exchange. If you have a smart device at hand, just open the camera, focus on that code, and it will take you to the exchange. Alternately, you can type the web address displayed, tejoin.com, into your browser and enter that nine-digit ID when prompted to get to the same exchange. Once there, you'll see our conversation prompt asking you to pose your questions. Your questions remain anonymous, as do your rankings of others' questions. When you're done entering questions, you will be given the opportunity to rate the questions of your fellow attendees on a scale of one to five stars. Doing this will help me direct our panelists to those questions of greatest importance to you. You may choose to keep it open during the presentation so that you continue to pose questions and rate the questions posed by others. I will display this QR code and a web address a couple of more times during today's presentation. Attendees, you have all entered this webinar in listen-only mode. This means that you are muted and the speakers cannot hear you. As the webinar ends today, you will see a brief 10-question survey that we would appreciate your feedback on. Let's get started with the protection of fish habitat under the Forest and Range Practices Act. Our presenters today are Doug Wall, a professional biologist with the Forest Practices Board. He is working on the territory of the Sayelix Okanagan Nation at Summerland. And Derek Tripp, professional biologist with Tripp and Associates Consulting. Derek is broadcasting from the territory of the Comox First Nations at Courtney. Others that worked on the Fish Habitat Project are Hannah Horn, a professional biologist, now heading the Cumulative Effects and Monitoring Program for the Ministry of Forest, Lands, and Natural Resource Operations, Rob Shear, professional engineer and professional hydrologist, and Sean Hamilton, professional biologist and fish habitat specialist. I'm going to signal Doug, Doug, that he can now go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, uh, joining the call. The board would really like to give a warm welcome to uh, the almost 400 participants that have decided to join the conversation today. We are representatives from four levels of government, including First Nations, federal government, provincial government, local government, uh, resource professionals, uh, foresters, biologists, fish habitat specialists, also uh, forest licensees and ranchers. So it's quite a broad spectrum and we really appreciate you taking the time to join in. So first, I'm just going to give a brief overview of the Fish Habitat Project. You may have recalled in uh, July of 2018, the board published um, the first of a two-part report on conserving fish habitat under FERPA or the Forest and Range Practices Act. And that first piece dealt with uh, really the governance is uh, government's approach to protection of fish habitat uh, on the forest and range land base. But also we looked at uh, input from a broad spectrum of resource professionals about issues or concerns they had uh, uh, that are occurring on the ground or around planning for protection of fish habitat. The second piece is what we're talking about today is part two, is really about looking at taking the, the issues of concern or the areas of concern from the part one report and what we found on the ground. And I'm gonna give you a brief overview 
of how we went about that. But first, I just want to share, it's a bit of a spoiler alert. It's the board's perspective really on the findings of the part two investigation. And that perspective is really uh, the need for a new culture of good sediment management. Derek's going to talk about the results of uh, uh, sediment issues into streams and fish habitat. And at the strategic level, um, again, that the new culture of, of good sediment management, not only for the protection of fish habitat, but also the protection of drinking water, where the board in its previous investigations has identified that as an issue, again, from sediment being deposited from roads into streams. Okay, so what we look at, um, again, all of the, the real detail of the approach is in the report. Uh, we looked at five case studies. Obviously, we couldn't uh, be uh, looking broadly over British Columbia, so we took a case study approach. In those five watersheds, two are fishery sensitive watersheds. That's a designation under the Forest and Range Practices Act to apply special management because there's a recognition of high value fish habitat. You seem to have lost audio from Doug. Derek, I'm going to ask you to take over at this point. Hi, everyone. This is uh, Derek talking. We've uh, lost Doug for a little while. So, uh, so as Doug mentioned, uh, we took a case study approach to uh, looking at uh, the issues with fish passage, riparian buffers, range use, channel condition, and sediment uh, from roads into streams. They are scattered around the province. I'll show you a map soon on those, but basically we spent up to five days in each watershed. Uh, here's a map showing the distribution of the five watersheds. Uh, they range in the north from uh, the Owen watershed, which is right beside Houston. And moving clockwise, we go down to Wood Jam uh, Creek by tributary the Horsefly Drainage near uh, Horsefly. Uh, down south, we looked at the Panaska River uh, drainage, and I know Doug just wants me to mention that this is one of the most important rainbow trout streams in BC. And then I, I quote you, he said, possibly the world. It provides 40% of the brood stock for rainbow trout in BC. It's located uh, on the uh, Coquihalla connector between uh, Kelowna and Merritt. Then there's the Ainsley watershed uh, near Boston Bar, and then finally over in the far west, it's the Mimiki watershed on Vancouver Island, just north of Campbell River. The licensee uh, planning that was examined uh, in these five watersheds was found to be primarily driven by uh, considerations of ECA, or equivalent clear-cut area. That applied to uh, the Mimiki, the Owen, and Woodjam Creeks. The other uh, watersheds did not have any metric like ECA to determine uh, rate of cut in those, uh, in those watersheds. ECA is a common metric used throughout BC. Uh, not really positive. Uh, that is well that, that well connected to uh, you know uh, outcomes on fish habitat or fish numbers, but it is uh, a widely used metric that is related to uh, uh, gives you an index of a hydrological response in in response to a, a amount of clear cut area in a watershed. We looked at the, how much watershed monitoring was uh, going on in each of these uh, watersheds, and for the most part, there was no uh, monitoring. Uh, neither the Ainsley, the Panask, or the Wood Jam had any monitoring to speak of. There was extensive monitoring conducted by uh, the Watershed uh, Status Evaluation uh, Program using FRET protocols for fish passage, riparian uh, condition, and water quality. The Owen also had an extensive uh, very extensive uh, FREP water quality monitoring along uh, the Marie's Owen Forest Service Road and its uh, major branches. Uh, there was fish data and uh, rather riparian data uh, and fish passage data also collected on that, but unfortunately uh, it hasn't been published yet, so uh, the Forest Practice Board did not use that. Thanks. I'm going to jump back in for a little minute here with us. Hopefully we'll be able to hear more from Doug in a few minutes as he does some behind the scenes technical work.
Before I take us back to Derek, I would like to remind you of our ongoing thought exchange. I've just displayed a QR code and web address to take you to the exchange. As a reminder, this is the method we're using to gather questions from the audience for our panelists to address at the end of the presentation. Your questions will remain on anonymous, as do your rankings of other folks' questions. For those that arrived late and missed my earlier instructions, if you have a smart device at hand, open the camera and focus on that displayed QR code, and you'll be taken into the exchange. Alternately, you can type in the web address displayed, tejoin.com, into your browser and enter the nine-digit ID when prompted. You may choose to keep it open during the remainder of the presentation so that you can continue to pose questions and rate the questions posed by others. I will display this QR code and web address one more time at the end of our panelists' presentations. One last reminder before I turn things over to Derek. As this webinar ends today, you'll see a brief 10-question survey that we would appreciate your feedback on. If you miss the opportunity to complete that survey today, you'll get a chance to access it through the follow-up email that you will receive in the next few days. Okay, thank you, uh, Sky. And uh, regrets to Doug for missing out on the webinar right now. As uh, was uh, mentioned earlier, I'm gonna go through the results now of the investigation, the field investigation part that is, and I'm going to cover uh, all of those five elements, uh, looking at fish passage, uh, riparian uh, condition, uh, range use, channel condition, and finally ending with probably the most important part, uh, sediment off of roads into streams. Starting with fish passage, uh, to be honest, we did not see any fish passage issues in any of the five watersheds we looked at. Almost all of the uh, fish passage structures on uh, fish bearing streams were bridges. The few culverts we looked at were considered passable. The only possible uh, culverts that uh, we thought might be a problem uh, were actually on pre-1995 uh, roads, older roads. And I think there was one other culvert on a uh, identified fish stream that when we looked at turned out to be a non-fish stream that had just been defaulted to fish on the basis of gradient. Okay, well, here's uh, uh, what I just uh, you know said about the uh, uh, risks of fish passage. They were low in all of the uh, five watersheds. So really a good story, uh, a good result, and it indicates that in the province uh, we do have a pretty good process and culture for identifying uh, fish streams and ensuring that uh, fish passage of those streams is adequate. Now the next element of the investigation dealt with uh, riparian buffers. Uh, what you're looking at here in, in this slide is a uh, the riparian buffer on the Panasque uh, River. This buffer was actually part of a provincial park, and so it varied from anywhere 175 meters to 500 meters wide on each side. Obviously, the stream is well protected with those kinds of buffers. What we found on the other uh, uh, forage ranges was that licensees are actually leaving uh, you know, more timber than they're legally required, which is only the reserve, repairing reserve zones on S1, S2, and S3 streams. In almost every case, uh, I would say they left not only the riparian reserve zone, but also the riparian management zone, which is another 20 meters of timber tacked on to the reserve zone to protect it, primarily from wind throw. It wasn't quite uh, like that on the uh, other streams, which do not actually require a legal, uh, uh, there's no legal requirement for a buffer on non-fish streams or even small uh, fish small fish streams less than 1.5 meters. We call those S4 streams. But what we did see was actually, there was at least some attempt to have some retention on most of the streams. Now our, our investigation was focused, to be honest, on the larger fish streams and the fish habitat. And we didn't look as much at non-fish bearing streams, particularly small non-fish bearing streams. But what we did notice is that uh, while those were protected, if the stream was located not on the edge of the block, but actually in the middle of the block, that's invariably where we saw some issues. And as you can see in this slide uh, right here in the, uh, uh, on right now, it was primarily because of wind throw in high risk wind throw prone areas right in the middle of a cut block. So there's still some you know, management uh, work to be, needs to be done uh, to protect uh, small streams if we're going to leave any kinds of buffers on them. You can go two ways on that. You can go wider 
which is of course uh you know uh, uses up uh you know protects more timber uh but you can also go uh, narrower by just being a lot more selective about the harvesting taking wind throw prone trees i've seen this done by several divisions in bc and it can be a very effective uh, approach overall we gave a low risk rating to uh, four of the five uh, watersheds the only watershed that got a moderate rating was the owen and that was because of the uh, wind throw we observed on a couple of uh, small streams where they had left uh, buffers on a mid block stream Range use. The uh, picture on the left is a uh, section of Wood Jam Creek where uh, cattle had uh, trampled the banks extensively, trampled the channel bed as well, and through decades of overgrazing the area, pretty much eliminated much of the uh, riparian vegetation along 300 meters of the channel. The picture on the right, that map you see, the section of Wood Jam Creek that's outlined in red is the affected area, so that's about 300 meters. During this investigation, uh, board personnel met with the rancher and uh, local uh, range staff, and they decided to build an exclusion fence around that whole area. Uh, that's what you see that yellow line is starting from the rancher's uh, private property, which is all fenced up in the right-hand corner, and it goes all the way around that affected area. Range use, like uh, you know, uh, the uh, results on fish passage and riparian condition were actually pretty good. Uh, wood jam, obviously, uh, we gave it a moderate rating because of that damage we see, uh, we saw on that 300 meters. There were a couple of other uh, locations on smaller streams at road crossings where there was uh, road damage as well. But overall, the uh, rest of the uh, watersheds did not really show any damage due to range use. Now, in all fairness, Ainley doesn't have any range use. The Memeke has very limited range use. It's just a uh, horse use uh, permit. The Owen and the Panask had more. And uh, again, uh, we, we didn't really see the degree of impacts on the streams that we saw on Woodjam Creek. And for that reason, we give it a low rating. Channel condition. Channel condition, condition is just a, an excellent metric of uh, or a measure of uh, what's going on right at the site level. Plus it, it integrates what's uh, happening upstream because whatever impacts occur upstream invariably get get trans uh, you know uh, mitted downstream here you see an example of a, uh, a grading channel that's infilling with fairly large quantities of uh, sediment and sediment here is both uh, fine uh, sand and silt sediment that you see piling up on the bank on the left side on the picture and then there's an uh, extensive mid-channel gravel bar uh, uh, made up of gravel and cobbles that are being carried downstream uh, the sources of all this sediment could be very complex, very varied. A lot of it is from erosion, uh, bank erosion, which you can see in the background there on that channel, but there's also uh, erosion off of roads. There's uh, uh, erosion from uh, wind throw right on the banks. There's uh, erosion from some kind of uh, you know, road failures or natural, natural sloughing or mass wasting. So, uh, you know, channel condition wasn't quite as good a story as the uh, ones for, uh, you know, uh, fish passage and range and, uh, you know, uh, riparian condition. Three of the watersheds got a moderate rating. That's the Ainsley, the Memeke, and the Owen. Only the Panask and the Wood Jam we, uh, we considered uh, to have a low uh, risk of impact to fish habitat. And the Ainsley, uh, in fact, all three of those uh, watersheds with moderate impact, you know, natural mass wasting and natural, you know, peak flow events were definitely a contributing factor. But in the Ainsley, that was made worse by uh, some fairly significant uh, road uh, failure issues. Uh, in the Memeke, uh, there was also a history of old logging impacts that were still quite evident to us. Now, these old, old impacts consisted of, uh, you know, the stream had been logged right to the stream edge, so the banks were uh, eroding away uh, quite back and retreating away from the channel. Plus, there was a massive uh, logging at an old, uh, you know, mass wasting site, which that probably happened in the late 80s, and even to this day, it was still significantly affecting uh, channel conditions downstream. The Panaskin and the Wood Jam, there were specific sites that had uh, impacts on them, uh, but uh, when we looked uh, downstream of those sites, conditions actually were pretty good. So uh, for that reason, we we considered those impacts to be highly localized and not affecting the uh, uh, watershed uh, level con uh, channel condition at all. Sediment from roads into streams. 
was a uh, was a, a very uh, you know a significant and pervasive problem. Uh, there wasn't uh, I think uh, really one watershed that that didn't show problems with that. Uh, it was identified as the most widespread and pervasive problem. And uh, this slide right here, you can you can see as an example of just how much sediment actually can be carried down by a road uh, onto the bridge uh, onto the bridge right there. And that's just from uh, some sediment actually on the road surface. So it doesn't include any any sediment from anywhere else. I would say this road could have been constructed so that the bridge might have been elevated a little bit. That would have reduced the chances of uh, sediment getting onto the road. And you know, I think the road itself. Uh, you know, it's surprising how many roads were not crowned or in sloped or out sloped to try and direct water off the road before it got all the way carried down the road as that you see right here and dumped onto that, uh, uh, that bridge deck. Now uh, sediments washing off the road is obviously not the only source of sediments that eventually reaches in the stream. Here's uh, two examples I guess were some of the most common and that was uh, you know basically bare, non-vegetated uh, cut slopes that were, uh, you know, basically constantly washing fines down uh, onto the road service or onto the ditch. And then the ditch lines themselves on the right, sometimes the ditch lines themselves actually eroded quite a bit just because of the uh, large volumes of water they were carrying down long, long runs on the road. Now, I would say definitely that ditch could have had a lot more uh, ditch blocks in it with cross trains going across it while they cut cut the you know slope on the left you know that's that's a tough problem i would say location might have been the biggest issue there but uh you know there needs to be some steps taken to revegetate it and stabilize that slope somehow it's that it probably be one of the hardest things to do and would have been solved best by maybe uh, not putting the road right there in the first place uh, Sediment off the road sometimes is captured by ditch lines, but in this particular example on the Maurice Owen main line that goes along Owen Creek, the ditch line went for absolutely kilometers and kilometers, uh, funneling water off off the uh, off the road down along the uh, ditch until it uh, would hit a, a creek crossing, and then a lot of the water sometimes spilled right into the uh, into the creeks, not directly, but usually because the berm broke at that spot. I would say a, a more uh, a better approach would have been to purposely, instead of trying to maintain that continuous ditch like that, purposely break that ditch line, the berm on that ditch line, at a lot more strategic intervals away from the creek so that the water then could just spill out onto the forest floor without impacting the streams. Here's a summary of, uh, of the uh, uh, risk of harm to fish habitat. Three of the five watersheds uh, we felt had a high impact. That included the Ainsley, the Owen, and the Panask. Uh, wood jam got a moderate one, uh, and that was uh, not only because of the uh, you know cattle impacts, but also because of roads. Uh, primarily because of roads, actually, when we uh, actually measured the amount of uh, material coming off many of those crossings. Interestingly, the Mimiki, which has the oldest uh, history of logging and is probably the most heavily roaded of all the watersheds with the most crossing, ended up with a low level uh, of risk. And uh, that was uh, mainly because, uh, yeah, when it was measured, that was the, the average rating for all the mimicry crossings was less than one cubic meter. It's actually 0 0.55 cubic meters. Now, some of the common problems I alluded to a couple of those before uh, were, uh, I guess, most of them, they were all aspects of the uh, building roads contributed to the problems of sediment. That went right from road location and design all the way through to construction, maintenance, and deactivation. But what we were looking at primarily was, uh, you know, road design and, and maintenance. And uh, so, as I mentioned, well, we noticed that uh, there was relatively little attention um, put to directing water off the road surfaces, either by crowning or insloping or outsloping the roads. Hand in hand with that, there was not enough ditch blocks and cross drains in the ditches to take the water that was being carried down the ditch lines, what water actually did make it into the ditches, and take it off before it actually reached the, uh, the, the cross drains. Uh, generally, just a lack of erosion and sediment control generally, and specifically maybe not enough, uh, not enough uh, vegetation, revegetation efforts made, not enough hydro seeding, and I guess, yeah, just a lack of uh, sediment management, uh, specifically in erosion control after you have a lot of problems. I'm going to give you a, 
a little demonstration here on some water and uh, what this actually means in terms of uh you know uh you know impacts to fish or or uh you know uh, salmon and trout and char eggs if you can see this this is a uh, basically drinking water. It's got a uh, suspended sediment concentration of two milligrams per liter. And if you look at that bottle and look right through it, and you can see that black stripe on my shirt. So I call this my Secchi disc shirt. You see, it's actually pretty clear. So this is actually pretty close to being acceptable drinking water. It's, it's right on the border at two milligrams per liter. Some watersheds, municipal watersheds might be issuing a boiled water advisory if the water was like this or really any significant amount of time. And by that, I mean, you know, uh, we're talking about days. If your water is at this level, uh, you might get a boil water advisory. What does this mean to fish? Well, to juvenile adult fish, this is absolutely no impact whatsoever to them. To, you know, salmon, trout and char eggs, they're a lot more sensitive because they can't move. Uh, and this water gets filtered through the gravel eventually. Water is seemingly as clear as this, when you look at dose response relationships between suspended sediment levels and egg to fry survival, this water will give you anywhere from 65 to 85% survival. So there is a slight impact, all right, in some cases, maybe even a, you know, a fairly meaningful impact when you're looking at 65% survival. But still, pretty good. Not drinking water, not pure, clean drinking water that we're used to in uh, you know, the Coquitlam Reservoir or Capilano or down in Victoria or our local watershed here in the Comox Valley, but pretty good. Now here's water you, not everybody gets to see, uh, except for those of us who work in the woods all the time. But this is a uh, fairly turbid water. It's a thousand milligrams per liter. Uh, if you look at my shirt, you can't see the white, uh, the black line at all on my, on my white shirt. Very, very turbid. This is what you see on uh, roads or running down the ditches when uh, during you know rainfall periods or or major runoff periods. Uh, maybe it's short term because it's only happening during the rain, but uh, it is a, a fairly significant amount of water, uh, turbid uh, or set sediment being introduced into streams when you have this level of sedimentation, uh, suspended sediments. What's it mean to fish? Well, fish exposed to this for uh, a couple of days would be considered moderate to severe impairment. Now, there'd be no uh, no fish killed in this, but they're definitely uh, impaired uh, in terms of feeding behavior, uh, growth, uh, stress hormones, uh, gill function. Uh, they do not thrive in this type of water at all. Now, salmon, trout, and char eggs exposed to this for two days you'd have 0% survival. All of the eggs, according to dose response relationships, will not survive. This water at 40 milligrams per liter is quite a bit cleaner, but you know what you see, looking through the bottle at my shirt, it's still fairly murky. This is water that you will see in something like the Fraser River, believe it or not, down by Mission or, uh, you know, Petula Bridge or uh, somewhere around in that vicinity of the lower Fraser River. It is fairly murky when you look at it in a river that is quite deep because you can't see the bottom. So it'll look very, very dirty. But in fact, this is probably what it looks like for during the low flow periods uh, for maybe seven months of the year. So we're talking, uh, you know, August all the way through to the next runoff period in starting in March or April. It'll be either this or even less than that. What does it mean to fish? Well, uh, this to juvenile and adult fish is, you know, a slight impairment for 10 to 100 days. Not much of an impact on uh, juvenile and adult fish. But as I said, you know, the uh, larval stage, the egg stage of, uh, you know, salmon and, 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 and trout and, and char, quite a bit more sensitive. If you had, uh, you know, 50 days of this, 50 times 40 is 2,000, so that's equivalent to two days at 1,000 meters, 1,000 milligrams per liter. So 100% uh, mortality on fish eggs if they're exposed to this for 50 days. Well, we don't see those heavy concentrations of sediment too often, to be honest. And where they are, they're, 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 they tend to be 
uh, you know, sporadic depending on rainfall and isolated uh, in the watershed. So what does it all mean though to, to uh, you know, to, to the watershed as a whole? This was a nice clear drinking water, as I said, and we said survival in this kind of water would be, say I said 65 to 85%. This is a concentration that we can expect in a watershed like the Mimiki, which had a low rating uh, down uh, where, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, salmon, chum salmon, pink salmon, coho salmon eggs are deposited in the uh, lower Mimiki River. Four milligrams a liter is the concentration. I calculated that by just taking the total amount of sediment produced at the roads based on the data collected for the, by the, with the water quality effectiveness evaluation. And I divided that by the total amount of water that actually flows down the Mimiki during that egg incubation period. And this is the number I get. It's four milligrams per liter for the egg incubation period in the winter, 150 days. Egg to fry survival in this type of water, we're down to 40%, 40 to 5 40 to 45%. So that's, for this water alone, that's a 20, 25% reduction. Now the Mimiki actually got a low rating. And compared to uh, the province, uh, it does a lot better than uh, most uh, other uh, areas. Uh, as I said, one out of, uh, I think one, 15% of the samples in the uh, Mimiki River were rated at moderate to high. Now, the FREP provincial water quality data will tell you that 30% of the uh, sites have a moderate, high, or very high rating. So these results that we got on the uh, sediment roads can you know, completely agree with the FREP water quality results that have been telling us for years that, you know, uh, there's actually quite a few sites with substantial sediment being introduced into the crossings. Now, I think that information can I go back to that uh, that slide just briefly? Anyway, it doesn't You can. Matter. I'll bring that back for you. Okay. This is a summary slide on uh, you know sediment from roads into streams. When you look at that slide and you think about what the FREP water quality uh, data is saying, that should send off some uh, you know significant alarm bells. And I wonder, though, if it really does, because uh, we've heard about, you know, sediment related impacts for so long that we might be tone deaf to those uh, to that issue. Now, I wonder if we uh, accept that this is the cost of doing uh, business, that the problem is not really that serious. I've heard a lot of people say, well, you can't, Derek, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. But uh, I think those uh, that ship has sailed. Those days are long past. We're not talking about one omelet or a few eggs anymore. There are over 650,000 kilometers of gravel road in BC, and probably close to that number of stream crossings. That alone should make us step back and think: Well, what are we really? How are we really impacting fish with this a large? Amounts of sediment on a very sensitive, uh, you know, stage of their life's history, specifically the the uh, the uh, larval stages of uh, you know salmon and trout and, and and char when they're when they're in the gravel. I think I, uh, I think I'm going to stop right there, and uh, move on. Doug, would you like to take over now? Okay, I'm back. I want to apologize to all the participants. Uh, for that technical hiccup, I can assure you the team was online at 12:30 and everything was a go. And then as soon as it after it went to broadcast, so again I apologize and thank you again for everyone that joined us. If you remember at the uh, beginning of the presentation, I talked about that strategic message from the board about the need for a new culture of uh, good sediment management from forest roads into streams. Derek talked a fair bit about why this is important uh, because we're dealing with uh, fish. We're talking about other aquatic life that are impacted. We're talking about the importance of clean drinking water. And so uh, given, um, and, and Derek also talked about the results for the other elements we looked at. And in each of the watershed, there was at least one element uh, 
that was affecting or potentially affecting uh, fish habitat. We've really uh, narrowed it down because you saw the results of sediment from roads into streams that that really is the key challenge um, on the ground. There's planning issues, um, monitoring issues, but things that are on the ground or the issues on the ground, it's really about sediment from roads into streams. And in support of that uh, strategic message around in a good culture of sediment management, the board made two recommendations to government. And one is to have a, uh, a clear and enforceable requirement in the Forest and Range Practice, Practices Act to minimize sediment from roads into streams. And the second, which is equally as important, is uh, that government update guidance and training on erosion and sediment control. So we've got long-standing best management practices dating back to the early 1980s on straightforward measures such as road design and location, uh, erosion and sediment control strategies to minimize the amount of sediment entering streams. Okay. Please feel free to uh, connect with us. Um, you can talk to me directly or email me directly and call me at the number below. You may want to make uh, a note of that now or you'll be able to watch the recording um, and go to that, that end of it and see the, uh, the contact information and also connect with the board. Um, and uh, on our website, you can subscribe to board reports and that way all the reports and um, newsletters that we produce will come to you automatically. Sky. Thank you very much, Doug and Derek. You're welcome. Thank you very much. I am going to advance us to the QR code one more time. Hopefully you can see me in a moment. I am going to give you a few more seconds to get in there and uh, rank your questions. We've seen some great questions come up. Expect some great questions there from the Thought Exchange. I'm seeing 120 people have participated, so I'm looking forward to those. While we give a few more moments for those, I'm going to start with a couple of initial questions here. Um, Doug, what else is the Forest Practices Board doing to improve fish habitat? Well, the board is the uh, the watchdog of sound forest and range practices on Crown land. And as a routine in doing our compliance audits, which we are required to do, so that's compliance with the Forest and Range Practices Act, and of course the Wildfire Act, we routinely consider or examine how well forest and range practices have protected fish habitat. But also in our uh, investigations, that special investigation and complaint investigation where we receive and investigate complaints from the members of the public or other organizations. Some from time to time, they also include uh, uh, elements around fish habitat protection. So we're watching out for uh, ongoing for government's progress in and effectiveness in managing protection of fish habitat on the forest and range land base, as well as reporting those out to the public and to government. Thanks, Doug. Derek, I'm going to pose this next question to you. Are there things that it could improve sediment management that I can do now? You bet. You bet you can. Uh, I'd do two things right now. Right now, I would go to the FREP uh, website and, and find your data on water quality for your patch, your territory, and see what those results are, see where those sites are actually located so that you can go out and get a sense of, you know, what what they're talking about. The second thing I'd do is I'd, I'd get that water quality effectiveness evaluation protocol and I'd read it and learn it and then start actually going out and measuring that uh, sediment yourself. That way you will get a real good appreciation of what kind of uh, you know issues we're, we're talking about right now. I guess the third thing would be then to you know like you know expand that once you've learned a lot more you come up with, you can come up with a plan but you're going to learn these things Right from the get-go, as soon as you uh, uh, get that water quality data from uh, FREP and you go out in the field and look at those sites and you read that water quality thing, you're going to start learning 
things that you could have done or you can do right now. That's what I would do right now. Thanks very much, Derek. Uh, just for listeners, the, the FREP that Derek was referring to is the Forest and Range Evaluation Program. Yes, uh, and uh, I think, you know, David Maloney and Brian Carson should have been talking about that because they are the lead trainers for that uh, FREP protocol. And they're the people who uh, can give you the training, the expertise, direct you to where uh, you can get online training if need be. The next question that I have that comes from our thought exchange is, to what extent are these results compliant with the Federal Fisheries Act, in your opinion? Has the DFO been involved in this work? Okay, that's a great question. So um, under the Fisheries Act, let's refer to the fisheries, the new Fisheries Act. Uh, as you know, it's undergone some different versions. However, the requirement not to deposit uh, deleterious substances into streams has not changed. And uh, case law tells us that um, what is required is the substance that is deposited into streams um, cannot be uh, deleterious. It does not have to be deposited into a stream into quantities that are deleterious to fish. So it's no longer required to show that it had a deleterious effect and sediment is a deleterious substance. I, I'm not gonna draw conclusions about uh, whether I not, uh, or not there was compliance with the Fisheries Act because of course our focus is on the Forest and Range Practices Act and the Wildfire Act and in that, we've uh, really clearly identified the need for that clear requirement um, to ensure that uh, practices or licensees are minimizing sediment into streams. So I, I, I won't draw an opinion as sort of whether or not licensees are in compliance with the Fisheries Act because that is not uh, a piece of legislation that we specifically deal with. And I will leave that to uh, to the Department of Fisheries and Oceans to, to handle that question. Thank you, Doug. I'm gonna move on to our next highest ranked question. Could you go over the existing sedimentation prevention regulations that currently exist in the Forest and Range Practices Act? Okay, so one of the challenges that we pointed out is, um, in, in our view, in the board's view, FERPA intended to, um, through a variety of different um, sections in the regulation, specifically the forest planning and practices regulation, there's uh, some obligations around sediment management for section 59 protection of drinking water, but there is a test of whether or not the substance is harmful to human health, and that's an issue in itself. There's road rehab, uh, rehabilitation uh, requirements um, and where we found the gap though and specifically is around requirements for ongoing maintenance so section 57 is the primary fish habitat protection requirement and our view of that requirement uh, really limits um, the management or the requirement to prevent or minimize sediment into streams as part of the ongoing road maintenance obligations. So perhaps it was a, a, an unintended oversight of uh, in FERPA that in our view, it missed that core requirement around road maintenance. And that is where we identified when we were on the ground as the key issue affecting fish habitat in the five watersheds, except for the Memeke that we went into. Thanks very much, Doug. I'm gonna take us to another one down our list. Is ECA being used as an assessment method? Well, that's another okay. great question. Sorry, I just had it move on my screen there. I'm gonna highlight it for you. Is ECA being used as an assessment method for the watershed or a trigger for more detailed assessment? Okay, well, that, that is a really good question. And hydrologists tell us that 
uh, ECA, which is equivalent clear-cut area. It's a proportion of the forested uh, area of the watershed that has uh, reached uh, hydrologic recovery. And ECA um, appears in a number of orders for fishery-sensitive watersheds where there's been a threshold established around 25 or 30 percent of ECA. Um, and at that point, then harvesting uh, can't continue. Um, but hydrologists tell us that uh, ECA is one of many factors uh, that tell us or inform us about watershed condition. ECA upon it, uh, just on its own is not a good indicator of watershed condition. And moreover, what is really linking or, or missing in um, a, a straightforward or simple ECA calculation is the linkage between the amount of harvesting and roads and the road density in the watershed and issues around protection of fish habitat. So again, on its own, in my view and the board's view, not a good indicator of the condition of the watershed. There's multiple factors that need to be considered. We have an interesting one come up on our list here. Why is monitoring not mandatory? Well, that's a, that's a good question as well. So in the FERPA construct or the model of FERPA, um, you have pillars around uh, plans and practices, compliance and enforcement, um, and practices on the ground. And underlying that, there are the foundational elements of professional reliance and effectiveness monitoring. So uh, you can see in it, a, a good sort of process of description of that in the board's report on the forest and range evaluation program, where the professional reliance and effectiveness monitoring pieces are meant to inform the pillars. Um, so we don't see um, legal requirements for monitoring in the legislation. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, that might be appropriate. I'm not really sure. I don't have an opinion on whether or not uh, monitoring should be a legal requirement, but I will say this, that monitoring is absolutely essential in this uh, continuous improvement model of the Force and Range Practices Act. So without the monitoring, government does not know whether or not its objectives on the land base are being achieved. Thank you, Doug. Can you describe what you think revised legislation may look like? Okay, so I'm not a crafter of, of legislation, um, but I think it's quite important to, in a practice requirement, in terms of it being effective and well understood by a broad range of professionals uh, or practicer, practitioners, and if we're talking about road maintenance and sediment, it would, in my view, be preferable to be quite straightforward and simple. I think it's gonna be really challenging to start getting into limiting quantities of, of sediment that might be permissible. But what my preference is, I think is, and, and the board's preference is to really um, have a requirement that speaks to needing to do something on the ground. And that something would be applying the already well-established best management practices to um, prevent a non-compliance from occurring. So something around, you know, minimizing sediment into a stream and with the legislation and many practice requirements have this must ensure uh, clause. So that really speaks around due diligence or what did you do to prevent the non-compliance from occurring? And I think that is really important. It's the strategies that are employed to prevent harm. I think that is really the key. How that actually looks in, in legislation, I'm not entirely sure. Speaking of practices being employed, I've seen a few questions come up, Doug, about what practices resulted in the good results for road sediment in the Memeke. Derek, why don't you give us a description of your observations um, in the Memeke? Uh, 
Sure, uh, no problem. Uh, in the Mimiki, uh, this uh, the assessment of the work was actually done by Brian Carson, and he's you know better to speak to this. He, he can better speak to this than than me. But of uh, 50 sites looked at, only uh, eight of them were actually rated as a uh, moderate to high risk. The majority of the sites were actually in the low or very low category, and they were there for all sorts of reasons. First of all, they were not challenged with a lot of uh, very difficult uh, material to work with. Uh, the soils in the Mimiki are relatively thin uh, compared to, uh, you know, obviously other parts of the, uh, the province. They're uh, they're stony. Uh, they're 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 not. They don't a lot. Of fines do not, uh, not don't constitute a big portion of the soils in that area. Having said that, they there were is extensive use of uh, elevated bridges. Uh, a lot of the bridge approaches were were elevated, and so that water running down the road would actually fall off the road into the ditches uh, before it got anywhere near uh, the uh, uh, road crossing. These are bridges. Elsewhere, uh, whenever they had uh, just you know cross streams or uh, culverts on these uh, smaller smaller streams, they made extensive use of uh, strategic berms along there to direct water uh, down the road, and then they were punched out into the side away from the stream. And that actually had a you know a fairly significant factor, a significant effect on reducing uh, sedimentation. You know, it was my impression, looking at these other uh, watersheds, that maintenance was actually uh, more of an ongoing uh, process, especially where there was active logging. The roads there were, you know, they struck me as being well built. They were always crowned. There was always some sort of sloping on them, so the water ran off one way or the other. So those were kind of like the things that really, you know, stuck out. Uh, where they did have uh, problems, it was invariably on very, very long runs of a road where it just was problematic to try and kick off the water into uh, uh, forested areas because maybe the, the, the road was paralleling the uh, main stems or main streams a little too closely. So the amount of forest you had available for reducing uh, sedimentation was limit, more limited. So that was a challenge. It's always going to be a challenge in steep country where uh, you, know, you don't have a lot of options of where to put the road. And uh, sometimes the the, the buffering capacity of that riparian area might be fairly limited. And once uh, you have sediment entrained in a channel, that channel can then you know, go on and uh, form a brand new stream and the sediment never gets a chance to settle out. It's not going into the forest anymore. Specifically, it's actually just forming its own channel and heading down into the next, next tributary. Now that's, uh, I think those were the main reasons why uh, the Mimiki ended up with such a, you know, uh, uh, a good rating, uh, a little bit of luck uh, based on that terrain, but also a fairly good maintenance program and uh, the design on the on the bridges and the main main culvert crossings as well was taken into account and water was was really the the, the chances of water getting into streams directly that way was minimized. I'm going to pose one last question before we run out of our time today. I have. Other jurisdictions use road erosion models at the watershed scale that use LIDAR-derived DEMs to manage road-related sediment. Can BC do the same? I'm completely unfamiliar with using a LIDAR around um, sediment management, Sky. Derek? No, likewise. I have no experience with uh, LIDAR other than I know it gives you very, very detailed information on uh, on the terrain and slopes, gradients. Of course, that is important in uh, looking at, uh, you know, designing your roads and determining how many cross trains you have. I will say this. Uh, I've looked at uh, a lot of uh, road in the past, and uh, whenever I started to look at the road, I would look at the uh, design plans. And what I would always find is that when they ask for three, four, five, or six culverts, whatever is cross drains, in practice, sometimes it was only one or two. So the design may have been uh, pretty good, but actually putting all of that design into the on, on the ground out there didn't always happen. Sometimes there weren't as many culverts as the design required. And that that certainly cost. But I can see lidar just being a, a lot more uh, effective way of uh, of doing road design and in that way, uh, you know, uh, limiting sedimentation that way with the ability to construct in-sloped or out-sloped roads, knowing what the slopes are, where you can locate your uh, 
you know, your water uh, control devices and structures. Thank you, Derek. Uh, that's Sky, it. That's Sky, are we able to uh, continue on for a few more minutes if there's more questions? I believe we have another five minutes left on our broadcast. I can okay. scroll you down to this question here. Is there any follow-up with licensees regarding the documentation on wind throw assessment and what will be done in the future? Right, so the Forest and Range Evaluation Program, as they conduct fish uh, riparian assessments, as Derek has done many of those, um, an element of that assessment is looking at the causal factors affecting the condition of channel of the channel. And uh, part of that, wind throw has been a factor in a, uh, you know, I think it's around 10% or so of the sites that have been assessed. And also there's ongoing research into wind throw and uh, trials on the ground on how to mitigate or how to reduce the risk of wind throw. And it's, I will say, it's 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 a, a tricky uh, a situation to, to really understand uh, wind patterns in watersheds that you might be working in, it's a challenge. And it's, uh, it's an opportunity certainly that we identify for improvement. And I think government and licensees are taking action on to try and figure that out as best as they can and where those risks are the highest. Thanks very much for Doug. I saw another question here that I thought you might be able to cover just before we finish. What were the selection criteria for the five case studies? Okay, so obviously uh, we wanted watersheds that were important uh, fish habitat. And to do that, we consulted widely with Ministry of Forest Lands and Natural Resource Operations staff around the regions in the province. We also consulted with uh, First Nations we wanted to have some of the watersheds uh, identified as a fishery sensitive watershed. That was really about seeing, was there any significant differences in management in watersheds that were a fishery sensitive watershed? But importantly, we wanted current uh, forest and range activities ongoing in those watersheds. Um, so the report, you'll see um, all of the selection criteria that were used to select those watersheds. Thank you, Doug. That concludes our available time today. There are plenty of more good questions in that exchange that we haven't had a chance to get to, and the team will explore options for answering those for you. In your questionnaire at the end of this broadcast, one of the questions is if you'd like to see a follow-up where we answer more of those questions. A last reminder about that, please pop in and do that survey as it shows up. If you don't get to it today, it will come in your follow-up email. So thank you everybody for joining us for the thank protection you very much. of fish habitat under the Forest and Range Practices Act with the Forest Practices Board. Bye-bye. See you later. So